Experimental Queens and B Space. I'd like to thank Lee Morin, astronaut from NASA and project leader on the Orion Mission to Mars project uh, for giving a nod to my beekeeping and also taking care and supporting him and his family throughout the years. And here are some experimental queens. You see two of them in a cage and they're using their antennae to figure out what the heck is going on with each other. And um, no death matches have occurred. These queens are accepting each other. Okay, so how in the world am I doing this? According to the Journal of Avicultural Research, 2009, an article entitled Sustainable Multiple Queen Colonies of Honeybees, Apis mellifera Langustica, then published online April 2nd, 2015, uh, by the four researchers, I'm going to mess these names up, apologies in advance, Hu King Zhang, Shui Han Jin, Fu Ling Hu, and Christian Prick. Um, they go over the details on, um, as far as uh, materials and methods, etc., etc., um, pluses and minuses, and references as to why and how and who and what. Um, now, in Overseas, uh, the greatest economic importance of having more than one honeybee is that they don't specialize in making honey over there. That is an, that's almost like an afterthought. Uh, but unlike here in the United States, the afterthought of honey, um, you know, is, is to that of pollination. Well, pollination is also an afterthought over there in China. Their main goal is to get to the queen's milk, otherwise known as royal jelly or um, that which contains royal actin and in order to do that you, ha you have a queen that produces babies they get fed royal jelly you have two queens they produce babies simultaneously you get more royal jelly so the more queens the more royal jelly what they found is that it is possible to have multiple queen colonies which occurs in nature oftentimes when a queen um, you know she has after swarms etc you know sometimes into the winter time there will be two queens uh, an older queen and a younger queen uh, that will eventually get superseded come springtime it happens naturally but here it is in an unnatural state I just have two queens in an introduction cage using their methods so my first time doing this but look at this just some bees flying in the air randomly in the apiary have stopped by to check out these queens. Is it possible that the amount of queen mandibular pheromone they are releasing is so strong that these bees are just going, hey, something's not right here, there's a bunch of queens in here, wait, is this my queen or is this, I don't know, let's check it out. This seems important. So anyways, I'm taking these and introduce them into this colony which you see here. Will it work? It, uh, we're soon to find out. So it's an experiment. As you can see there are a lot of hive beetles in this nest. Um, this has been the bane of the last couple weeks here at this apiary. But remember, it's not where we've come from. It's where we're headed that matters. And we're headed in the right direction, hopefully, even though there's been a lot of tragedy in the process dealing with small hive beetles. Huh, those things are really tough to deal with when they when they start to get a stranglehold on an apiary so this is a red line queen she's from an experimental line of bees that trace back to Cornell's bee techs that we're um, finding the bees were um, mauling the mites. So, just, just wanted to put a really good mark on her because if you look at her abdomen, she, she's tiger striped. And uh, it's just uh, whenever you go hunting for a queen like this, they're a little bit more difficult to spot right off the bat. So, just being extra, extra careful with this queen. You know, uh, you can mark a queen's thorax, just simple, 
you know, you put a dab of uh, test orange paint on there, you're good. This happens to be a marker that I have. You know, I try using them because they're easier to keep on the on you when you're in the field or moving around. Just pull it out of your pocket. But there's pluses and minuses to them. Like um, the paint doesn't come out evenly sometimes, and you what do you call it? Um, the tips are real hard to. You can if you're in a rush, you can probably. I'm just guessing. You know, I haven't had it happen. You can injure the queens. Uh, so I put a nice dose on there you, lo you can look at it and see that some of it is actually um, has crept up onto her wings uh, it does not affect the uh, the way the bee is accepted in the colony it doesn't uh, do anything like that they just perform as usual um, so if you are concerned about overrun when you're painting your bees um, don't be because not a big deal most of that you can see her rear leg is is kind of quivering that's um, due to the fact that she's waking up right now she was anesthetized I just wanted to kind of you know look at her a little bit closer and while I was doing that I just kind of redid the paint as you can see I also have one of her rear uh, I'm sorry one of her wings at the very back is is clipped you know I do this uh, kind of helps forestall swarming not a big deal I mean your bees if they swarm they swarm um, and can be a waste of time doesn't it's neither here nor there but since I have my bees anesthetized oftentimes for examination purposes I go ahead and do it especially on a breeder queen like this okay that's all from the red line you can see her she's a pretty queen she's been laying up uh, pretty good somewhat conservative uh, compared to other bees that I run down here or up here in northeast Florida uh, depending on where you're located and um, pretty though see your mandibles there the tarsus so intact even her um, those are her tarsus the very ends of her feet you can see as you look at a queen their rear legs will splay out to the sides is sometimes an easy way to find them um, because oftentimes they're lighter in color too pink a lot of people say oh the legs are pink but take a look at this queen and you'll see that her legs are not like that they're pretty much the same color as the rest of the legs that she has and she has a nice tiger stripe abdomen, which is absolutely camouflaged in a pile of bees that are same same uh, color scheme. Uh, but nice queen nonetheless. Nice big queen, happy queen. Let's get her back with her kids. Now let's talk about bee space. Historically, the person who found it first was a Polish apiarist um, and Roman Catholic priest who in 1835 in Europe uh, discovered uh, bee space for his movable frame top bar hives to be that of 6.4 millimeters. Uh, but in the United States, a little bit later, a couple, couple decades later, Reverend Lorenzo Langstroth, the father of American beekeeping, native of Philadelphia, discovered it was 9 millimeters. So that's the space which bees crawl. Anything bigger than that, they build comb, as you see here. Anything smaller than that, they put glue in the place of that, propolis. So you see it occur in nature, and that's what you see here uh, in this lid that I have filled with comb.
And yes, this is a violation of B space example in which I neglected to put frames in the middle. So the bees went ahead and built honeycomb. So greater than the B space, they build honeycomb. Less than that, they put propolis in there. <clears throat> and just right at B space, they don't put anything in there because that's where the bees will walk. It's their space. This occurs in nature, and this is what we've done as people. We've taken this and turned it into movable frames. So until next time, everybody, work with nature, not against it. Thank mm -hmm. you.